you know, I was one of the people, I think a lot of the people in our audience as well were among the crowd of folks that were just, you know, really excited about the potential of you running in the last election cycle, maybe <laughs> as a, as a green party candidate or a third party candidate in general. Um, would you mind just talking a little bit about that? And also just to clarify, because you mentioned it, um, you're saying that if you had the right amount of funding and maybe some investors, so to speak, that you could uh, still potentially consider running in 2024? Well, okay, here's the deal, guys. First of all, here's how they make it hard. Let's take this a step at a time. They make it hard because there's no standard mechanism to get on the ballot in every state. They do that on purpose. Each state is different to get on the ballot. There's no one... No states are alike what you have to do. You have to get ballot access to be on the ballot so your name is on there. That has to start now to try to get that. You got They make you jump through hoops. They know the Dems and Repubs are going to be on the ballot. Anybody else? Okay, that aside. So what happened last time, I thought about it, and I thought the Greens are the most powerful that I saw the third party, and they thought like me, because I'll tell you this, right now, guys, to me, you know what the most important issue on the planet is? Climate change. To me. And I ain't going to be around. I'll be 99 in 2050. You know that latest thing that came out and talked about 2050? Well, if I'm here, I'll be 99, which means I'll be eating soup, watching TV. You know? <laughs> yeah, I won't give a shit. And so... But the point is, to me, that is the major, major issue because that affects everybody. everybody we're going to destroy our own planet if we don't freaking wake up. It's as plain and simple as that. So I looked, and since that's such a passion for me and I need something passionate to run on, right, the Green Party seemed like the natural fit. So I approached them. I got... Not exact. I got welcomed by about half the party and unwelcomed by the other half. And then I came to learn the party was in the middle of a major split. So what it would have required of me would be to mend the split party first and then take on the Democrats and Republicans. How am I going to accomplish that? I ain't Superman. You know, I got to come to a party that's you, when I ran in Minnesota, we had a united party. Do you know how good our party was in Minnesota, guys? Only one person got paid. Everybody that worked for me was a volunteer. Doug Friedline, the campaign manager, left his private sector job, and we paid him the equivalent of what he would make. And you know what his private sector job was? He sold pull tab gambling in a group of bars, you know, so nobody got paid on my campaign. My entire governor's campaign was volunteer. And so I get to the green party, they're fractured to begin with. And then you got, they had a candidate who I guess was going to get the nomination who nobody heard of. I could have put him on the map. There were polls out there that had me at double digits already. And you know what the question I got from the Green Party, the ones that, that they said, well, is he one of us? And I sat back and went, one of what? What is one of you? I have a record. I've been a mayor. I've been a governor. Look at how I vote. Listen to what I have to say. And I'll bring, I'll bring this party into the national game. Well, couldn't do it. You know, and so I walked away and said, I can't put them back together. You know, they were split and fractured already. And, and when I was governor, I brought all the third parties together at the governor's mansion, tried to get us to formulate into one unit so we can take these guys on and not run four candidates. Get behind one. We found the common denominator. None of us took dirty money. Well, you know what the rest was like, guys? Herding cats. They all had their pet issues and ran off every direction and couldn't. You know, so I threw my hands up, said, I got to govern the state of Minnesota. I said, I can't be fooling with this shit. 
you know, I got a job to do that the people elected me to do. And I took criticism. Well, why didn't you create a third party? Because I figured I was doing my job. Govern Minnesota, prove to the people the third party can govern. That was my job. My job is not to go. That's who the head of the party is supposed to build the party, not the elected official. I have a job to do. And, I, and if I do it to the best of my ability, more people will believe in us. And we'll get more and we'll win more elections. So, you know, and Trump, Trump immediately flew to me. Oh, and he, he used my campaign like a playbook. Only he did a couple things different. I took on the Dems and Repubs at once, at the same time. Now, that's what I would have did presidential. There's no guarantee there. I, I could have got beat. So I got to give Trump his due. He took them on one at a time, and he was successful. The first thing he did is he became a born-again Republican, because he wasn't when he met with me, but he became a right-wing born-again Republican, and what did he do? He defeated the Bush dynasty. That gave him control of the Republican Party. Then he took that control, turned around, and beat the Clinton dynasty, who ran the Democratic Party. And here's the thing we need to know. Do you remember how they always scream about Russian interference in the 2016 election? Do you know what they'd caused? Do you know what the actual Russian interference was? They exposed that the Democratic Party was fixed that Bernie could not win, that Hillary had it locked up, and that it was just a game, right? Well, I came out and said we should be thanking them for exposing one of our parties for their fraudulent behavior of making us believe they were actually having a Democratic runoff between Bernie and Hillary when it was a joke. Hillary had it. Well, Trump then took the Republicans, and he beat the Bush dynasty in the Republican Party. He then turned around in a general election, and he beat the Clinton dynasty and won. So I can't argue with the mechanism and method he used, just that I personally couldn't have did that. I couldn't have sold my soul to the hardcore right and pretended to be one. You know, And I often laugh today, the hardcore right, thinks he's the second coming or whatever. And I think to myself, can you imagine what they'd say if Barack Obama had kids from three different wives? That's <laughs> like so true. Trump? That's so no, true. What would the hardcore right say about that? Yet they have no problem that they, they got this guy who's had three wives and had kids by all three of them, but he's the champion of the religious right. <laughs> right. Well, just to break in real quick, uh, Governor Ventura, sure. wanted to mention that you know I am a Green Party voter myself. I did end up voting for Howie Hawkins in the last election, sure. but I I thought it was incredibly, incredibly foolish of them to be honest to um, kind of deny you the nomination um, or at least not embrace you with open arms. The Green Party has been around for what 20, 30 years now, yeah. and they have they have yet to crack five percent in a you know, a national presidential election. And even if you weren't able to win the election, I do think it's very, very yes. possible you, you could have got on the debate stage. You could have, you know, rocketed that party uh, to far more viability and name recognition going forward. Um, so even if there were some slight disagreements, uh, I just thought it was really disappointing the fact that they didn't take that opportunity. And we interviewed um, Howie Hawkins on the Vanguard. It was actually our very first interview ever. And I asked him about uh, the possibility of you taking the nomination. And I was actually a little bit uh, offended, I guess, on your behalf, because he, he kind of dismissed you and referred to you as a celebrity, um, to which my response was, you know, this is a former governor of a state, a former mayor of a city in Minnesota. Um, he has more political experience than you, Howie. So how are you going to sit here and reduce him to a celebrity? Yeah. <laughs> and Well, and you know what the other one you could have told Howie was? Howie. He's 2-0 and oh in elections. What's your record? The man's unfortunately <laughs> never won a single election ever, and I'm sure his heart's in the right place. But yeah, that was kind of a foolish answer. Um, yes, exa exactly. And we're talking here, taking on something that the presidency, you know. Well, well you know, I'll tell you, that here's another fun story, guys. 
you heard when I said I wanted Howard Stern to run with me. People thought I was being foolish. There was a method to my madness, guys. Howard Stern and me, I think, could have won. Because, first of all, when you run for president as a third party, you need a VP who's so despicable they won't kill you to put him in. And Howard Stern, perfect. See, I know they ain't going to kill me then, assassinate me, and put Howard in. <laughs> well, Governor, have you heard the wait, rumors? Wait, wait, wait. So here was the other reason. Howard would allow me to keep my integrity because he could go on serious radio and say, look, people, we need 25 bucks a piece, 50 bucks a piece. How much money could he raise? Unbelievable amounts of money. That would keep my soul together of not taking special interest money because all the donations would be $50 donations from individuals. And that would work. Plus, serious radio is not governed by the FCC. We could have stayed on the air right to the election day. And how's this for a plan? You tell everybody that listens to you, look, here's what we need to have you do. The day of the election, we need you to get 10 people to vote for us. And if you all go out and get 10 people to vote for us, we'll win. Of everybody that listens to Howard Stern, you'd have serious radio as your platform right up to the election. And I couldn't get, I talk serious to Howard, as serious as I am to you right now. I couldn't get him to do it. And that's when I renamed him Hampton Howard. Because the Howard I knew 15 years earlier would have did it. He'd have did it just to F with the system. You know, he'd have did it. But well, now, how he lives in the Hamptons. <laughs> right. Have you, heard, have you heard the rumors, Governor, that um, he might be considering or mulling a potential run in the future? Who, Howard Stern? Yeah, he dropped a couple hints about that a few months back. Well, why doesn't he call me? That's a great question. I'm the one that just dropped the hint. Somebody call his show and say, well, isn't that what Jesse Ventura wanted you to do with him? We're putting out the call right now. Put the guys, call to Stern and tell him, give credit where it's due, Howard. You're going to steal my idea now and try to tell the world it's yours? Uh, yeah. And besides, you don't want Howard at top of it. You need Howard at VP. You know, I'm telling you, you know, somebody got to run the military. I got six years in the service. True. You yeah. know. Uh, one of the. By the way, do you know who I'd put in charge if I won? Do you know who I'd put in charge of the CIA? Who? John Kiriakou. You familiar with John? Yes. He's the guy they put in prison who wouldn't torture people, and they sent him to prison. I figure that there's a guy with integrity, and I would want someone running the CIA who I know has integrity. He's not Alan Dulles. <laughs> 